My family is Catholic. I was Catholic. I come from a very Catholic family. Roman Catholic? Yes. I'm a Catholic. I am part of the Christian religion. Well, more Catholic. You've had a Catholic background? Yeah, I have. Are you a Catholic? I am. I'm a Catholic. Raising me and my sister Catholic? I am Catholic. Catholic, yeah, Catholic. Well, I'm a Catholic. Are you Roman Catholic? Yes, I am. So when are you going to repent and trust in Christ? Now. As soon as I can. As soon as probably the interview is done. As soon as I can. So when are you going to repent and put your trust in Christ? As soon as possible. So many Catholics seem to be coming to a genuine faith in Christ lately, and one main thing is responsible for that. We're going to talk about what that one main thing is in this video, but first, it's important to highlight what the main differences are between Catholicism and Biblical Christianity. As you may have guessed from the word biblical that I just used, it all comes down to the Bible. Sometime around the 4th century AD, there were certain practices that began to creep into the church little by little and more and more over time. This resulted in a drift from the teachings and the practices that are found in God's Word. Some of these errors included the mixture of works with grace as a means of salvation. Also the worship of carved images and the saints and Mary. The doctrine of transubstantiation which teaches that the Eucharist might become the actual body and blood of Christ and the concept of purgatory. Now, now, there were genuine Christians within the church who tried to bring correction to these errors when they cropped up, and this eventually culminated in what's called the Protestant Reformation back in the 1500s. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh no, not another hateful Catholic bashing video. Friends, nothing could be further from the truth. Listen, I grew up Catholic. I have family and friends whom I love dearly who are Catholic. And trust me, I have a lot of them. This is a mission of love. This is our attempt to tactfully, biblically, respectfully, and lovingly share the truth with our Catholic friends. Now, what typically happens when you ask some Catholics if they're born again? And you'll see. Have you been born again? No. No, I don't think so. Did they tell you you need to be born again? We're born again in like heaven. You know? No. No, I was just raised Catholic. Have you been born again? Not yet. Not that I don't know. No. I don't think so. I don't believe so. I don't know. I'm born again? I have been born again. Born again uh, since 25 years ago. In Mexico, the a, a town with all everybody Catholic. But they misunderstood the Bible. They, they misunderstood. I wish that everybody could understand how important it is to be born again. Yeah, John chapter 3, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're not going to enter heaven. Your Catholic Church should have told you that. He's not talking about being sprinkled as a baby or christened. He's talking about repenting and putting your faith in Christ for your eternal salvation, where the Holy Spirit enters you, you become a brand new person in Christ, you pass from death to life, God opens the eyes of your understanding and gives you everlasting life as a free gift. First time you were born, it was radical. When you're born again, it's just as radical. So you would know. Ray is right. You must be born again. And Ray is right because he's repeating what the Bible says in John 3.3. 3, you must be born again. In fact, unless a man is born again, he's going to wish one day he was never born at all. Ian Bounds said that, and I agree with him, because it is a fearful, frightful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, because God is altogether separate and different from his creation. He is holy. He is perfect. So repent and place your trust in Jesus Christ. Receive him. And the Bible says, for as many as received him, he's given them the right or the power or the authority to become a child of God. We are not all children of God. Only Christians who have received Jesus Christ are children of God. That's what John 1 verse 12 tells us. Being born again is like putting on a parachute. Believing in God is like believing in a parachute. There's not much difference until you jump. You jump without a parachute, you're going to perish. Die without being born again, Jesus said you're not going to enter heaven. So it's essential that we talk about being born again because I want to see you in heaven, man. I don't want death to seize on you and God give you justice. Also, you're supposed to receive his body every Sunday. You're supposed to, technically, you're supposed to be receiving the body and the blood of Christ. Did you hear what he said? Technically, you're supposed to be receiving the body and the blood of Christ. This is based on a doctrine that I referenced earlier briefly that's called transubstantiation, which teaches that the Eucharist become the actual body and blood of Christ. But the question is, is this biblical? First of all, Christ does not need to be sacrificed again and again. 
Hebrews 9, 25 to 26 says, not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Instead of Christ being sacrificed again and again, which in essence is what's happening in the mass, scripture tells us that this happened once and that's it. Secondly, our Catholic friends oftentimes like to point to Matthew 26 verses 26 and 27 as a proof text that the elements within communion were the literal body and blood of Christ. This is a passage where Jesus was with the disciples and he said to them, hey, take, eat, this is my body and take this drink of it, all of you, this is my blood. My simple question to dear Catholics is this. When Jesus said that, where was he? I mean, had he died and had he risen again and were the disciples gathered for communion and he can say to them, hey, basically you're sacrificing me again and this is my literal body and this is my literal blood. No, when Jesus said this to his disciples, he hadn't been crucified yet. He was with them in that upper room where they were having what's been called the Last Supper. So when Jesus said, take, this is my body and hey, take, this is my body blood, it had to be symbolic because he was there with them and he hadn't been crucified yet. Jesus was not endorsing cannibalism. We take certain parts of the Bible literal where we are supposed to take it literal and we take it figurative where we're supposed to take it figurative. Remember, Jesus also said that he was the door. He was not saying that he was an actual wooden plank with door hinges and a little door knob. In fact, while we're on it, he also said, I'm the true vine. He was not saying that he is a literal branch with roots, right? That, that, that is ridiculous. Another text that Catholics will point to at times is John chapter six, where Jesus talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But they forget the fact that at the end of that discourse, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. He was speaking to them again in a spiritual and in a symbolic manner. In fact, this same truth is reiterated in our ministry's evidence study Bible, where Ray in the commentary section highlights this truth. He says, however, when read in context, the meaning becomes clear. Jesus went on to explain that he was speaking spiritually. By the way, you can check out this evidence Bible that's packed with a lot more truth on a lot more subjects by clicking on the link in the description. Do you believe the Bible? I do believe in the Bible, yes. And Satan? Yes, I do. Do you know what Satan does according to the Bible? No. Well, it's called the tempter, and he tempts us to do that which is evil. Lying, stealing, blasphemy, fornication, adultery, rebellion against God. Satan also blinds us to the truth of the gospel. This is what it says in the book of Corinthians, in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. What does it mean that Jesus died on the cross? Only, only him and God know. So he died for me. Why? He saw the good in humanity. Maybe give his own life for his own true beliefs and trying to get a message out to God that people aren't as bad. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Um, I don't have an answer to that. That he died for our sins. Yeah, but what does that mean? How does that affect you 2,000 years later? Mm, the fact, I don't even know. Why did Jesus die on the cross? I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, so you've been to many Catholic church services and they haven't told you? No, they will, I maybe I think, no, not really. They just say like he died to save us. He didn't, they don't like specify why or what are going to happen to us or why, the, what if he save us? I'll, I'll. I think there's an afterlife. No. Why are you wearing a cross? My mom gave it to me for a graduation gift. What's the gospel? I can't even really answer that. Do you know what the gospel is? It's like um, words of the Lord, right? No. Have you ever heard the gospel? That's what I know. Again, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of sinners as to the truth of the gospel. These precious Roman Catholics who have seen paintings of Jesus on the cross, have sat in front of crucifixes for many years, have no understanding as to why he died. They don't understand the gospel. But watch what happens when they do. The good news is that Jesus destroyed death. The Bible says Jesus Christ has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So I want to share the gospel with you and the gospel will tell you exactly why Jesus died and exactly what his death on that cross can do for you. The claims of the Bible are fantastic in the truest sense of the word. I mean, like fantasy, they just don't make sense. Jesus Christ has abolished death. There's still people dying everywhere. And Jesus said, I am he that was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and hold the keys to death and hell. How could someone find everlasting life through the gospel and yet still be subject to death? I'm going to share that with you. Do you think you're a good person? 
I like to think so, yeah. Do you think there's a heaven? I do. How do you get there? Honestly, I, I personally believe it's just being a good person. That's your ticket in. Okay, now I'm going to give you a scenario just so you understand what's going to happen. Let's say I'm a doctor, you're a patient, you think you're very well. I've seen x-rays and I know you're dying. You've got two weeks. I've got a cure, but I'm not going to give you the cure straight away. I want you to see the x-rays because you're not going to appreciate and appropriate the cure if you don't believe you're diseased. Now you think you're morally well. I'm going to show you the x-rays, the Ten Commandments. Can you handle that? Yes. I'm going to try and change your mind about being a good person. Hmm. Because what you're doing is trusting in a parachute that's full of holes. I want to take it off you and give you a parachute that's trustworthy. Can you handle being a bit uncomfortable? Yeah, for sure. Are you a good person? I think I am, yeah. Let's go to the 10th commandment. Have you ever desired something to belong to somebody else? Yes. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Do you put God first in your life? Do you love him with your heart, mind, soul and strength? I like to think that I do. So you do love God? Yes. You ever used his name in vain? On accident, yeah. How could it be on accident? It's just like you're surrounded by it everywhere, so then it just slips out occasionally. And So would you ever use your mother's name as a cuss word if everybody was doing it? Mm, no. Of course not, because you respect her. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes, I have. Yes. I'm not going to lie, I have used it a few times, and I felt guilty over that, and I did pray after about it, asking for forgiveness, because I know that's not a good thing. Sometimes it slips out. So, Colby, you don't love God if you've used his name as a cuss word. Instead of saying the S word, you've used God's name in his place. You've taken the name of the God that gave you a mother, that gave you life, and used it to express disgust. That's called blasphemy. Very serious. It's punishable by death. I lied to people, it was little white lies, but... Have you stolen anything from anyone? No, not stolen, no. Is that one of your little white lies? No, no, no. Okay, like, you believe in God? Yes. So God is your witness if you tell me the truth, mm -hmm. or are you going to lie to me? Have you ever taken anything that belongs to somebody else in your whole life, irrespective of its value? I only once. You so know. you've told a lot of lies and you're a thief, is that right? <laughs> yeah. I've stolen something? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, um... I stole uh, one one time, yeah. You stole one time? One time, you know, and I and I went to confession. I confessed that, but other than that, I, have, I, don't, I, don't, I don't steal. Have you ever been disobedient to parents? Yeah. Have you lied and stolen? Yeah. You were looking at the x-rays and they're not, they're not good, not pleasant to look at because they're showing you you're diseased morally. Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Oh, I wouldn't say lust. Okay, when did you last look at pornography? I don't know. Just recently, huh? Maybe, yeah. yeah. That's lust. That's committing adultery in your heart when you do that. Have you had sex out of marriage? Yeah. Yes. Yes. What in the world is Ray Comfort doing asking people such personal questions? When's the last time you looked at pornography? Have you had sex outside of marriage? Is Ray a glutton for punishment? Is he waiting for someone to punch him in the nose? Because that's what you think is going to happen. Why does Ray do this? He does it because he cares about people. As you can imagine, even though his name is Ray Comfort, this is very uncomfortable for him. But he wants people to understand the seriousness of their sins in the sight of a holy God. That's why you'll often see Ray take people through the Ten Commandments. The Bible tells us that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. One of those Ten Commandments says, do not make for yourself graven images. And then it goes on to say not to bow before them. In other words, don't worship them. Unfortunately, this is something that we regularly see done in Catholicism. However, most Catholics will tell you, wait a minute, we're not worshiping these images. We're not worshiping the saints and Mary. But isn't it really just semantics when you think about it? Imagine your doctor says to you, hey, you're having surgery tomorrow, and so I don't want you to eat any solid foods. You go, no problem, doctor. So you go home, you get some chicken, you get some meat, you get some vegetables, you throw them in a blender, you blend everything up, and then you drink it. The next day you go to your doctor, he's getting ready to do the surgery, he does a little ultrasound to make sure everything's clear. He says, wait a minute, I told you not to eat any solids. And you look at him and you say, no, no, doctor, I didn't eat any solids. I drank my nutrients. You see the semantics there? Catholics say, no, they don't worship Mary or the saints. That's their official teaching. They're not supposed to. But what is it really in practice when you're bowing down before something, praying to it, when you're lighting incense to it, when you're putting wreaths around it, when you're carrying it and paying homage to it? These are all acts that are in keeping with worship. So in reality, it just becomes semantics. You can say, oh, no, no, I didn't eat any solids. I drank my nutrients. You can say, oh, no, no, I'm not worshiping the saints or Mary or these images. No, I'm just respecting them and showing them honor. Friends, at the end of the day, it's worship and it's idolatry 
and it's sinful and wrong in the sight of a holy God. Watch now how people continue to react when they're told they've broken God's commandments and watch what happens because of that. So here's a quick summation. I'm not judging you. This is for you to judge yourself. Gabriel, you've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart, who's self-righteous and saying you're good when it's obvious you're not. You're like the rest of us. Does that mean everyone is going to go to hell? Well, it means everyone's under the death sentence. The Bible says death is wages that God pays you for your sins. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. In other words, your death is evidence that God is deadly serious about sin. You've told me that you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart. If God judges as you buy those Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Guilty. 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 Would you go to heaven or hell? Um, probably hell. Hell. More than likely hell. Now, does that concern you? Yeah. It horrifies me, Colby. I've just met you, but I love you, and the thought of you going to hell takes my breath away. Now, does that concern you? Putting it like that, yeah, because, like I said, I come from a very Catholic family, so it's, you know, confess your sins, and God will forgive you, and, you know, like, everything will be okay. But if you put it like he's going to judge me, like, with the Ten Commandments, yeah, it's a little, it's a little scary. A little scary? It's terrifying. <laughs> you know, the Bible says to Christians, Wherefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I'm trying to persuade you today that God is angry at sin. You know, if you see a burst of lightning, that's nothing. It's not even God showing his anger. It's just the nature that he created. And the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you look online and you see a judge has given a criminal a $5 fine, what can you conclude about his crime? That it wasn't a big crime. You see a judge has given the death sentence to a criminal. What do you conclude about his crime? That it was worth the death penalty, that it was horrendous. It was deadly serious. Do you realize the Bible teaches that God has given you the death penalty? Did you know that? I did not. Yeah, it says the wages of sin is death. In other words, God is paying you in death for your sins. You've now seen the x-rays. You're going, what should I do? That brings us to the gospel, that good news of everlasting life. Have you heard of Jesus dying on the cross? Yes. Of course you have. Everybody has. But they don't know this, and this is what changes everything. The Ten Commandments, that which we've looked at, are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on the cross. If you're in court and someone pays your speeding fines, a judge can legally let you walk. You can say, oh, these fines are paid by another. You're guilty, but you can go. And God can take the death sentence off us in an instant, not because we're good, but because he's good and kind, and he provided a savior. He can let us go because Jesus paid the fine in full. That's why he said it is finished just before he died. He was saying paid in full. And then he rose from the dead, defeated death. It was not possible that death could hold him. All you have to do to be saved is repent of your sins. Repentance is where you turn from sin. You confess and forsake your sin. You don't play the hypocrite. You repent and you trust in Jesus. I feel like everybody has to go through hell first to like get cleansed to get into heaven. You're not even a Catholic. I know, but it's just some things I've been thinking about. Well, that's an unbiblical Catholic doctrine. It's saying Jesus didn't do enough on the cross. We have to do something ourselves and go and suffer in a place called purgatory. And there's no such place in scripture. In Catholic theology, purgatory is a place where the Catholic soul goes to to be cleansed by fire so then therefore it can be acceptable in the sight of God is that what the Bible teaches no listen if man must pay for or atone for or suffer for their own sins then Jesus's sacrifice on the cross was not enough but when Jesus died on the cross he said it is finished right paid in full tell it the SDI it is done it is complete the transaction is over the father has received the payment not the bribe Right? You cannot bribe the judge of the universe. So either Jesus was the perfect, sinless Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, like John the Baptist says, or he wasn't. So the only place that exists is heaven and hell. So you receive the sacrifice that Jesus did, or you atone for your own sins in hell, and you'll never be able to do that because God is perfect. You see, we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace. And that is the word that people need to study. It's what separates true biblical Christianity and Catholicism and every other worldview. Grace is God's unmerited favor to the infinitely ill-deserving. And though it's true that the Roman Catholic Church teaches grace, it does not teach grace 
alone. Because we have violated God's moral law, we stand condemned before the holy creator of the universe who will judge the living and the dead. And that is why we are in such great need of God's grace. No good deeds or religious rituals will get us out of this spiral downward trajectory in which we are heading unless God intervenes alone. Ephesians 1 tells us that in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You see, Christ is not asking us to clean our lives up. He's commanding us to lay our lives down. It is not an invitation. It is a declaration. And though it is true that there is none who seek after God, the good news of the gospel is that God seeks after man. And I like what one commentator said, you know, you're at the closest moment of receiving God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness when you begin to realize that you cannot do anything right. Because our sins are completely forgiven, God will never grab a hold of our sins and shove them in our face and remind us of what a blow it we are. No, right? God does not give his grace by calculated measure. You come underneath the spout where God's grace and mercy and forgiveness come pouring out. And if you're a Christian, you've been forgiven by the only one who can condemn you because he reached into the dark cavern of your heart and he turned your heart towards him. God does not dismiss his wrath against sinners by the wave of a magic wand. You see, salvation is a free gift, but it cost the Father everything. Galatians tells us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse in our place. Christ made it clear that through his substitutionary death, he demonstrated his hatred for sin, yet his love for humanity. And through his obedient life and submissive death, he provided a way for people to be declared righteous in the sight of the holy judge of the universe. Jesus took the punishment that people deserved by willingly laying down his life. You see, Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because you and I owed a debt we could never pay. If you want to grow in your Christian faith or you want to know more about what the Christian faith believes concerning certain topics and issues that arise in everyday life, well then check out our podcast, The Living Waters Podcast. As it stands, I feel like I should still in part take responsibility for my actions and still try to be a good person. Do you know what that's called? I don't. It's got two things wrapped up in it. Number one, self-righteousness, which is a sin and pride. So I don't want to humble myself and say I'm not good enough. And the Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Scripture says he that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Gabriel, you're so close to salvation. This is your eternity. This isn't who you're going to marry or what you're going to do for a job. This is where you're going to spend eternity. The only thing that can save you is God's mercy. Don't try and earn mercy. It won't work. Just fling yourself on the mercy of God. Can you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm hearing you. The hardest people to reach with the gospel are religious people. It's like they've been inoculated. They think they're good enough. When the Bible says there's none good but God. Jesus said, come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest to your souls. That rest is speaking of giving up trying to earn heaven because it's a free gift. You don't have to labor to find everlasting life. It's a free gift of God so you rest in Christ and what he did on the cross. Is this making sense? Yes. You're going to think about what we talked about? Yes, I am. When you're born again, he'll give you his Holy Spirit, and that spirit is life itself. And when there's life, there's no death. It's like when you turn a light on, the darkness leaves. When God puts his Holy Spirit within you and you're born again, born of the Spirit, the presence of life banishes death. So when I die, I go straight into the presence of God. I've got everlasting life as a free gift. Don't have to earn it. Don't deserve it. It comes by God's amazing grace. Is this making sense? Yes. You're going to think about what we talked about? Most definitely. When are you going to repent and put your faith in Christ? I'm going to try to confess my sins on Sunday. Gabriel, confessing your sins won't do anything for you. It's like confessing to the judge. You committed the crime. He's going to say, good, we've got a confession out of you. You need to be born again. You need to repent and put your faith in Christ. And don't wait till Sunday, man. You could die between now and Sunday. A lot of people die in their sleep, aneurysm, car accident, cancer. You just don't know when you're going to go. So there's a tremendous sense of urgency. The Bible says, today if you hear his voice, don't heart in your heart. And the thing that'll stop you coming to Christ is your love of pornography. The devil's going to whisper in your ear, tomorrow, tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. So when are you going to repent and put your faith in Christ? Today. 
The Roman Catholic Church says to be saved you must be a Roman Catholic, you must take the Eucharist or the Mass, you must repent, you must confess your sins to the priest, you must do this, you must do that. The Bible says there's nothing you can do. It comes as a gift from God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can't earn eternal life by doing anything religious. It comes because of God's amazing grace. So when you trust in the grace of God, God remits your sins, grants you everlasting life as a free gift, and then you live a life of goodness, not to try and earn heaven, but because you're grateful to God for forgiveness of sins. And he's given you heaven. Can you see the difference? One is trying to bribe God by doing good works, and the other is doing good works because God's shown you mercy. The Bible says, to them that sat in the shadow of death, a light has sprung up. That's talking about the birth of Jesus. You are sitting in the shadow of death. You're not going anywhere. You can't do anything about it. You can't run from it. It's coming for you. It's called the grim reaper. But to them that sat in the shadow of death, a light has sprung up. That's the Savior. And if you take light into darkness, the, the darkness leaves instantly. And if you allow the light of the gospel in your life, death will leave you instantly. So you've got a, a choice today. You can continue in sin, the pleasures of sin, fornicating with your gorgeous girlfriend, looking at pornography. Or you can say, that's going to lead me to hell because God's holy. And you say, God, forgive me, create a clean heart in me, and he'll do it, man. It'll be a personal miracle. I do appreciate the insight and the teachings you've given me about a little bit of God and Jesus that I did not even, haven't heard of or haven't read about. Do you have a Bible at home? I do. Have you heard of the Bereans in the book of Acts? I don't. The Bible says they were very noble, and when they heard the Apostle Paul speak, it said they searched the Scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So don't just believe what I'm saying, because this is your eternity that's involved. Check it out in the Bible. Just open the Bible and say, God, if what that guy was saying is true, please lead me, because my eternity's at stake. We're talking about heaven and hell. Would you sell an eye for a million dollars? No. What about 10 million? No. Give you 100 million cash for both of your eyes? No. You wouldn't even think of it. But your eyes are merely the windows of your soul. So how much more is your life worth? So when are you going to repent and trust Jesus? As soon as I can. As soon as probably this interview is done. When you repent and trust Christ, then you'll be born again. God will give you a new heart with new desires. You'll come out of the kingdom of darkness into light. You'll come to know God. And you'll have a knowledge that you are saved from God's wrath. You have eternal life all because of his mercy. That's called being born again. So when are you going to repent and put your trust in Christ? As soon as possible, I guess. As soon as possible? Yes. What about now? I should. When are you going to repent and put your faith in Christ? As soon as I can. Can we do it now? Yes, indeed. So when are you going to repent and trust in Christ? Now. Today. As soon as possible. Today? If I can. So when are you going to repent and put your faith in Christ? Now. You going to think about what we talked about? Yeah. I do appreciate you coming to my life at this moment. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And at the moment, you're unsaved. And salvation is as close as your mouth, the Bible says. If you just confess Christ as Lord and say, I trust him for my salvation, you'll pass from death to life. You've got God's promise on it. May I pray with you? Yes. Father, I pray for Junior. I thank you for his open and honest heart. I pray he'll be genuinely sorry for his sins through Jesus on the cross. And this day, may she repent. May he be born again today and pass from death to life. I, I pray that he'll think seriously about his secret sins and how you proved your love by Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And may today she find a place of genuine true repentance. I pray this day she'll see sin in its true light, that it's deadly serious, and that she'll see your love expressed in the cross. And they'll understand what you did for him on that cross and be born again with a new heart and new desires. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, here's a uh, coin with the Ten Commandments on one side and the Gospel on the other. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. The reason it looks like a bundle of millions of dollars is because it's more precious than all the money in the world. <laughs> it tells you how to find everlasting life. Do you think you'll read it? Yes. Probably by tonight. <laughs> the most important decision that you're going to take in your life is who you're going to marry or what are you going to study, but that's not. The most important decision is to accept Jesus as your Savior. The time in, in, in this world is this tiny. The rest is forever. Whether you're a Catholic or you're not a Catholic, we really hope that you see that this was all, as I said at the beginning, a mission of love. We care about our Catholic friends and we want them to know that genuinely. And if you're a Catholic and you happen to be watching this video, our hope is that you will recognize the truth that you must be born 
again. That if you have adhered to the false teachings of the Catholic Church, that you would repent of that and you would recognize that Christ is the only means that God has provided through which we must be saved. It's not of works. It's based on His grace and it happens through faith. And so turn to Him. Receive that free gift as I as a former Catholic did and as many other Catholics have. And if you're not a Catholic and you're watching this and you are a born again believer, then care enough about your Catholic friends to tell them the truth. Because friends, eternity is at stake. What are you doing to me? What's going on here? Yeah, we're sending out Gospels of John. These little fellas, a million of them, in boxes of 200 each. We feel like giddy little kids that we're actually able to do this now. You know, I mean, we're, we're working here, we're in the midst of, you know, busyness and getting everything done, but this is translating into these getting into the hands of Christians all across the country. And not a million people, but a million homes are gonna get the gospel. Think of how many people in those homes are gonna read that right. And it's God's word, it's not just a book. This is the Gospel of John. That's what makes us super excited. Yeah. And look at who, who's not going to pick this bad boy up? You know, as Christians, we often figuratively pray for God to open doors for us to get the Gospel out. But we did it literally today. Check out Ray Comfort and the big door that's open for him to get the Gospel out. Eyes closed. Well, that stinks. Oh, oh perfect. Oh, excellent. Good. Enjoy. Have a good day. Got something for you guys. I'm giving away stacks of millions. Enjoy. Have a good one. <laughs> when I mentioned this, the first conception of it to my editor, who's brilliant, she says, you can't do that. You can't have a book without a title, without a spine title, without anything on the back. But I'm so glad we did it because Brad Snow, our graphic artist, did an incredible job. Oh, so incredible. Amazing. The first time I saw the artwork, I said, Brad, you're going to get me in jail. <laughs> I said, it's just too real. And he said, nothing on this is real. It's all perceived reality. Yeah. And so it's a, he did a wonderful job. Well, and we you know we're shipping these out in boxes like this, but we have something at Living Waters called the Vault as well that Ray came up with. This Gospel of John contains something of infinitely more value than all the money, all the gold in the world. And so uh, it's to be valued, so we keep them in what's called a vault, and you can store a hundred of these in a vault, and when they get down, there's a little card that says it's time to re-vault. It, it gives an added element of excitement, you know, the vault and, and the way these things look, and again, the concept of people just driving their cars and just tossing them in their neighborhood, uh, and thinking that God's Word is getting into people's And it doesn't return void. Amen. First time I ever did this, I thought, what if this would work if you toss the books up driveways? And I did about, I don't know, 30 or 40 homes, went back three days later and only one that I'd missed tossed hadn't been picked up. So I thought, wow, this is a way to get God's Word into the homes, not just at a supermarket or something like that, actually into the homes. And uh, as easy said, who's not going to pick this up from the driveway? The thought that all your neighbors are, are getting the gospel delivered to their home, it's, it's just a thrilling thought. And by the way, those one million copies of the Gospel of John were given away free of charge by our ministry, and we even paid for the shipping. We produced a booklet called How a Catholic Can Be Sure of Heaven. It's a word-for-word -word transcript to the full interview with this young man you've just seen on this video. In other words, it contains a complete gospel presentation. And on the back is a QR code that will take them directly to this video. You can get the booklet on livingwaters.com. Watch this young Catholic lady embrace the gospel and say that it was mind-opening. You can watch it right now by clicking up to your left.